No progress. I got it. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> welcome to this edition of Beers with Bill. It's my great pleasure to welcome back Marvin Dick. And we are sitting here at Newstat Spring Brewery, as you can see the brew house in the background. Marvin, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Bill. It's my pleasure to be here again. Yeah. So we're going to have a conversation. We're going to ignore them, okay? Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to keep my phone. If you throw up anything in the chat line that's a question, Thomas is going to text me and let me know. So what beer are we going to start with tonight? Um, we're going to start with the IPA. Just mess with our taste buds right away. So Cool. But everything has, they all have something sort of unique element to them. So yeah, when tasting beer, like there's all these rules in place, but I feel like these four beers kind of like float the rules a little bit. So that's why right. not? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like you said, we're post COVID, it's the new normal. Rules out the window. Well, you know what? Maybe that's the way it should be. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is um, well, actually the first beer I did that was new to Newstead. So the whole, I mean, I think on previous ones, we talked a bit about this whole transition, like taking over you know, from an existing brewery that's been around for 20 years. You've got established brands, like really established brands. Yeah. Um, so you don't yeah. really want to mess with those things. Well, I'm going to say 10W30 yeah. and go down the list. We have them all at, at, at kickoff at any one time. For sure. Yeah. You know, people do them. They, they were well received. Yeah. So, 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 what do you come up with? Well, they never did an IPA. I love IPAs. One of my favorite styles. Um, but then the challenge is like, what, what do you do for an IPA? I mean, nowadays, like, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of IPAs. So, yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit old school. I like, um, I like a West Coast style. I like the New England. So, I couldn't really decide. So, this is kind of a hybrid of sorts. It's, it's not really any set style. It would be more west coast without the crystal malt if that makes sense so it doesn't have that color to it but yet it still has a bit of um a bit of maltiness and then no i'm trying to figure out which one i'm supposed to pick up should be that one i should have labeled it but yeah the this the coffee no i think it's it, it'll be that one pretty sure we have just a technical glitch here right now, people. We'll be good to look up. I poured them the same, so yes, it yeah. should be definitely that one. I would, yeah, you won't get as much of a punch um, on the nose, but it uses. So I, I love history. I'm yeah. history minor those sorts of things. So I wanted something to tie into the German history of this place. So I actually used some Pilsner malt. That was the, some uh, connection to, to that, but also German hops. So like whole melon and uh, some Hallertal Blanc, along with some local hops as well. So it's a, again, this hybrid of sorts, but not really, a, not meant to be a complex hybrid. Just sort of simple, a little bit of bitterness to remind you it's there, and seven uh, percent. But it's a fairly easy drinking seven. Because it's drink like seven percent. <laughs> I could see where this would be dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm trying to figure out the Hallertau Blanc. That's the mid tone. Mm -hmm. In here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you get it. They're kind of. Uh, in the middle, we did just pour these, so they're a little, uh, a little cool. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. There's, there's, you don't get any punch on the nose in that one. But I was trying to figure the mid, the mid tone was like I don't recognize that pop, so that would be the one. Yeah, because that's one I'm not experienced with, and I've really come to love it. Like um, I'm all about like when I'm selecting the hops, like you open the bag, you smell it, yeah. and 
I just find when it, the Blanc just has blown me away. And actually, the first time I really used it extensively was the Nothing Civil. Remember that beer we did at Wellington with yep. the yep. Um, Lacuna Collective? Yep. And, uh, and yeah, I believe it was Lexi's idea, the combination of that, her and Truth. I, I'm not 100% which one had the idea. <laughs> uh, anyway, that it was a yep. great beer, but it was, it was that idea I was tapping into. That one was uh, Mandarina and the Hallertau Blanc, but it was like, I, I kind of fell in love with the hop at that point and wanted to use it again. And I felt like it was a good sort of yeah. tie into this beer, so. Yeah, you know, we're going to the hop room after this. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna want to smell that. Yeah. Derek, when he was there helping us do the, uh, the, the collab with Eric. Yeah. That was the thing that, that we all love was being in the room smelling the hops. Oh. You know, it's just nothing like trying to figure out what case the house is gonna how's this gonna translate into a beer yeah and in this particular style here yeah and i love that forward thought like i, I think chefs do it too right when they're when they're mm -hmm. selecting ingredients they're like they can think ahead to what that's going to do in the combination right yeah. and your brain's having to sort of you know um creating the algorithm almost to like combine the ingredients but then it's not just the combination it's like the yeah you know how's it going to be expressed exactly in the process yeah yeah that's cool it's beautiful so so how how was this received when you launched it uh because i mean i, I guess I, i'm going from an assumption you you must have sort of a core following mm -hmm. of people that are in this region yes because they come here yeah and then you have your summer following yeah so how what was the reception of the core following uh it was crazy good like there were people um because they never had an ipa here it uh like we got people coming in that that asked just specifically for the ipa and they're they love hops like i do but they've also they really appreciate this beer this beer has been really tricky i mean for full transparency because our canning line is is not the best and i struggle with the air levels on it yeah. And that was really tricky. Like in the beginning, I've had to dump some like parts of batches, like because it wasn't lasting long in the can. Uh, and then, so what I've, I've taken to having to do is to just do super small runs. So I'll literally run off like 100 cans or so to keep it as fresh as possible. I'll keep the rest of the beer back and then we'll just can bits of it at a time. But you can imagine how problematic that is. Like, I'm having to sort of I, I'm oh. laughing because I know what that's like on a standing line. Yeah. Anyway, so that it's a bit of the bane of my existence right now. Like all the other beers, like they don't have enough hops in it for it to be a problem. Yeah. Um, and you'll notice I was selective and if you look at the beers I've released over the last bit after I figured out this problem with the canning line, it's like all right, I gotta stay away from hobby beers. Like my druthers would be to just produce a ton of different hoppy beers, but I have to really pull that back. Um, so once a new canning line comes, which is hopefully next week, then I can, you know, rest a little easier, sleep at night, and then start making hoppy beers again. So, but this, because I really feel like we needed an IPA, so I'm just doing this micromanaging of it right now to try to keep it, keep it fresh, but, I mean, it's still not all that it could be, again, because of these issues, but, I'm the more I'm trying this, the more I'm, I'm actually liking it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm thank you. It, it, it kind of grows on me. Yeah, it, it's a little different off the start, and and like I said, I'm I'm super critical of it because I know what it can be, and it's my baby, and it's like aren't we like all to, yeah. do something new? Yeah. <laughs> so you're right. It defines having a label added to it other than it's an idea. Yeah. Because it's not a classic idea. It's not an East Coast. It's not a West no. Coast. It's not a... It's a new set. It's a new set. Well, you know what? Maybe we're starting a new trend here. Well, I, that was kind of the idea behind like even the name and the label, like calling it New Day IPA. Like, um, yep. And it really, like it was birth, like, I mean, we were still in COVID at the time because it would have been... October probably at first brewed it and there was that sense of like you're in whatever at that point I don't know if it was the fifth wave or whatnot like it was really disheartening people were definitely losing hope right I mean, like, is this ever going to end and so the concept of hope and, and having 
that new day ahead you know, it was very yeah it was more than just a beer right so it symbolized something else and and we are my plan is to try to get this into the lcbo once um what you line. understand how the can can stand up yeah yeah so because i feel like again i like the label i think it's got a good shot and you know it's, uh, people like hops so that they do that they do so how's the relationship with the lcbo so that's something we gotta work on so it was basically in decline um leading to the end of the previous ownership um and it's a, it's a struggle but we don't have a full-time sales rep that's kind of dedicated to it so we have our existing um stores that work that we're really good in um and then it's just trying to expand that a little bit um but yeah the question is how much do we want to expand that right it's uh <coughs> excuse me um yeah we kind of wanted to see how the summer went because like my opinion about that breweries and craft breweries is like, we want to sell as much from this location as possible. Yeah. So if we can break even, if we can make a profit, if we can be successful in this location, then why bother with the, all the hassle of the extra space? Well, the reality is we do need that for volume. A uh, small location we're in, we get lots of summer traffic, but in the winter, not so much. So um, reality is we need it. So now, Coming out of this summer, I think we need to really develop a strategy and go after like we haven't even met with the LCBO since we've taken over. And that's just a function of not having a lot of people. And but that would be the next step. And um, yeah, just sort of trying to get out there, get 10 W30 out there a bit more and yeah, increase the the brand. <coughs> <coughs> So this is like a marriage. So I have to ask, how's the relationship going between all of you as owners? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question because you know there's always well I had hesitation going in because I've seen this happen a lot over the years and a lot of times things fall apart and uh, it changes um, over time. So we were obviously hesitant but but kind of um hopeful as well because we we align on on so many things like our vision kind of off the start now we don't agree on everything but it's that's the whole process and that's actually like i think we both both we appreciate that there can be a bit of that like critical thinking about stuff and then kind of arriving at something so there's been times that i haven't um thought the same way about something and then we will discuss it further we'll end, but we'll reach a uh, consensus at some point right and it's like a marriage there's some give and take and uh and i know they've been gracious to me and uh and you know we work through it but largely um we have the same goal in mind so it's like we're, we're moving towards that and they've been you know so supportive and are pouring so much time and effort into this um, brewery, like more so than than myself. And it's like, um, so yeah, it's just, you know, and it feels good like when you have the culmination, like after a year, we had our open house uh, for the community. We wanted to do it for a long time. Finally, we did it for the village. We had 300 plus people come through for a village of 500 people. Now, some of them work from the village. We got out a little bit, but still that was okay. And that was, that was huge. That felt like, okay, we're on the right path. People are, you know, buying into what we're doing and yeah. What a fantastic community. Yeah. And I'm not referring to the village, the community of like the Newstack Brewery. Yeah. Brewery community. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I know Christy said that she was really excited about that happening. And yeah. So, and that's a big part. I mean, that's always been, I mean, remember in Wellington days that I, like when you're coming up with trying to come up with vision and statements and, and different things like community was always one of the the c's that i would always throw around right because i feel that's pivotal to to breweries and uh and like you said not just the physical community but the, the broader community yeah right so um so important to to beer and and yeah we've just got more plans to bring people in and 
and the weekdays on the weekend we're, we're packed. We can't fit any more people here, but a lot of them are traveling for to the cottage and whatnot, but still we're getting people coming back. Like that's a big thing. Like get people come in and say, Oh, I was there um, whenever and they didn't have a good experience and they haven't been back for two to four years and they come back and like, wait a minute, this is like a whole different experience now. And so anyway, we keep plugging away, but I've always said too, it's one person at a time. And this is not like you yeah. throw out a marketing campaign and all of a sudden you have, you know, a couple thousand new followers. It doesn't work like that. So no, it doesn't. <laughs> but that, that's going to lead me into a question, but first we should talk about the next trip. Sure. Uh, so this one was really fun to make um, and name and all the rest of it. So whoa. We call this Cafe Crisp. Cheers. Cheers. That aroma is fantastic. But then I like that back end sort of smoky tone that's coming out. Yeah. Cafe Crisp. Cafe Crisp. So is that was because you were trying to avoid being sued by Cafe Crisp? <laughs> so it's really kind of a weird story that came about. We, we were bantering about other names. And one of them out there was, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, this is, you nailed it. Oh, thank you. This one kind of blew me away. It, it, it kind of exceeded my expectations. Um, I just wanted to make a beer that I, I liked. And it, to me, it's actually a, a total collaboration on this. So yeah, from the point we had a, a not so good name, I feel like to start with our working name, which was Hot Blonde. So now, we weren't going down the road of like any no, sort of- No, 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 no. But it was like hot as in coffee. We had yeah. a steaming cup of coffee and it's a blonde ale, right? It, it, it mm -hmm. kind of makes sense on a certain level. Yeah, no, but it was like- we're, no, I was laughing because <laughs> that was what was in my head. Hot cup of coffee, blonde yeah. ale. Yeah. I'm just gonna go with it. So we were bantering like, oh, but it can really be taken the wrong way. And like, we, do we really want to be associated with that, right? And um, so- you know, we were humming and hawing again. This is the, that process, right? Where where we um, try to find a name. So, but I feel like if we if that hit name hadn't been thrown out, we would never have arrived at the other one because then it changes the way you start thinking about it. So we were in the back tasting it. This was literally the beer was already done. Um, Vicky and I and we were tasting it together. And I believe it was her that came up with the name. She's like, well, we were just saying it tastes like coffee crisp. And like like a, in a beer form, I'm like, yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. And she's not a, a big beer drinker, but she's a great taster because a lot of times the the non beer drinkers are better tasters. Yeah. So she's like, oh, it's a, and then she's like, well, and then she just riffed on it and was like, well, how about Cafe Crisp? So we're not getting sued by Nestle and um, that. And then Mike, we threw it to him, and he just whipped up this whipped up but he made this label that just looked uh like the colors and it just looks great and people have been like it sold out um before i could figure out how to brew another batch of it so this is the second batch actually it's been going over really well and the other piece to it sorry i'm rambling here but no um, not at all this is this is this is what this is all about okay so uh, again I'm, I'm always about the local and the relationship so um there was a coffee guy that happened to stop in from Ashanti. Now they're in Thornbury. So, I mean, local up here, we're in a rural community. Local, it has to be fairly broad, right? So Thornbury is about an hour, a bit under an hour away. Um, I'd still consider it local. They have a, like three coffee shops, one's in Hanover actually. So Hanover's only 10 minutes. So it, like, and he stopped in, big beer drinker, love 10W30. And so I got his contact. I'm like, okay, well, I want a special coffee for this that, that blends with it. So I told him, what I was planning and he gave me this blend of coffee and it just like worked perfectly. So, cause I feel like it could go the wrong way too. If you didn't have the right coffee in this beer, it could totally taste like peppers oh, or I don't know, something weird. So I have no <laughs> idea what the coffee is that you use, but you guys who didn't get a hold of this, you need to try it because wow. And there's just a, a touch of lactose in it. So it, like not yeah. enough that you, you call it overly sweet, but I, I wanted that just to, again, give that, it's like a milk candy bar. Yeah. Right. So there's no chocolate. I didn't go that way, but no, I wanted no. the coffee to kind of come through. Right. So yeah. 
And again, no, that's 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 got the complex flavor of the chocolate bar. It does. It did that. What I what I was referring to on the nose though is like I actually got this massive earthy tone mm -hmm. yeah. on the nose, and I was like, wow, that like because that's sort of the flavor that I look for in scotch, you know. Yes, yeah. And I was like, wow, but then when I tasted it, like you nailed it, you got the flavor of a coffee crisp bar <laughs> in there. That's that just that was exactly what was in my head as soon as I tasted it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So now we just need some uh, Nestle dollars. So no. <laughs> I'm worried they'll come after our spring more than anything because we have such a great source of water here that it's. Uh, yeah. But no, like they obviously can't. Come there's a lot spring. of yeah. There's a quite a movement because Nestle sold that to them for. It's operating under a different name now. Right. And there's been a lot of flack about the whole process because everyone was up in arms when they got the new contract. Yeah. They were, they were supposed to get almost twice as much as, well, four times as much as they originally had. And all the communities got in arms about that. Yeah. Cause I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate here. It's like in, in Southern Ontario right now. We're not sitting on 20 years of drought like they are at West. Yeah. Everything that's going on at West and we're not, you know, we're not like Italy and France right now. This is an absolute total, like the rivers are running dry. Yeah. But we're not that far away from it. Well, yeah, if you keep taking the water, um, you keep, well, yeah, you keep pulling the water out of the aquifer and eventually it'll have an impact. Yeah. So, so I get that. But yeah, I can see why they would want to come up here because the, the water up here is fantastic. Yeah. Now, if that fast, then I'm going to go back to the IPA. Mm -hmm. Now, IPAs are much better if you have hard water. So, did you have to build the water before you made the IPA? No, the water here is, 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 it's really good. So I've got it tested. So it's, it's balanced, but hard. So it's not like out of whack. So it's not like a Laura. <laughs> no. no, not, not, not no, a Laura no. brewing. It's not like the it's water. It's yeah. massively hard. Yeah. Or KW, which is still just about as hard. Yeah, it is hard, but it's like, but the minerals, if you look at it, like, like they're balanced. So it's like, I don't have to do a lot to, yeah. um, to adjust it where um yeah like even wellington was pretty crazy to yeah do well yeah so. the blogger day when i had him on the show that that was 40 minutes of the conversation <laughs> yeah. it was all, and it was it was intriguing because like most of us take that for granted we don't mm -hmm. actually understand the amount of work that goes into making sure the water is right for the beer that you're making yeah, yeah. one of the things that i am always blown away by is how those early settlers kind of knew how to find water sources, right? So they came to this area, but there's there's water all over the place up here, but they knew that the water here, this spring, was going to produce good beer. And I mean, the brewery was built here in 1859 um, and was been producing beer apart from Prohibition and another chunk. Uh, oh, you sure they weren't beer. producing beer in Prohibition? Well, yeah, yeah exactly. they just didn't record that. Yeah. Uh, mm. We're bottling water right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, buying by, by an established brewery with a community that's already attached to it always comes with sort of pitfalls. Yeah. So, what was the process for you and your partners to walk through that to make sure that? I mean, my, my buddy in, in, in Woodstock had this whole conversation with me. He says, I got to paint this place. He said, so the first wall I'm going to paint is that one right there, because that's the door. So I'll never notice it's painted. And then I'm going to paint that wall here, because that's the one wall that most people never look at. He says, and then I'll paint this wall, and then I'll paint the wall that they always look at when they come in the door. Hmm. He said, because if I paint that wall first, they'll all be discombobulated. Like, it's like, oh, you painted what, What's wrong? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's it, 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 listening to him tell the story. It, it, it took 10 minutes to go through that, but it was, it was true. It was like he, he, when he finally finished painting the fourth wall, which was like a month and a half later. Right. People were like, they didn't even connect the fact that he painted the wall because everything was. Right. So, 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 what was that sort of process of navigating through being new owners, wanting to make changes, but also wanting to stay true to? The community that's already here. Hmm. 
Yeah, it, it definitely was was tricky to navigate. I mean, the worst part was is kind of on on the beer side because people want to make sure that you haven't messed with their beer that they've been drinking for 20 years. So like that was a big, uh, I remember the guy who wrote in the London Free Press, like that was one of the big uh, questions that we were, you know, as he worked through the interview. Um, then physically speaking, I mean, it was weird kind of, again, because we took over during COVID. So this place largely wasn't really open to people like there weren't tours going on so people weren't really coming in um and when they did it was for a very brief time and there, it was fairly you know cluttered and there was stuff around so i think we had the advantage of um like people it wasn't familiar to people so we weren't changing things in that sense it was always changes that people would be like so people still come in here. So here's an interesting anecdote. We get this all the time. People come in like, oh, you changed everything. Like, look at this tasting room. It's new. Well, the tasting room was done 12 years ago. So it was part of the old, very old thing. And Andy, I still maintain, he did a great job of doing it. The problem was, like, it wasn't tidy. It wasn't, like, you know, lit up well. It was, so now when people come in, it's, you know, I'm, I'm I don't want to badmouth the previous no, no, reason you, anyway. You, you tidied it up. You put that lighting in. And sometimes that's that's all you need to do, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, we've done more, obviously, in, in the rest of it. But in, I'm speaking specifically about the, the tasting room. It is that to me. I found fascinating. Even over the last little bit, I've dealt with a bunch of people. They're like, "Well, this is this is new. You did this," and, and I'm like, "Nope. Been here for 12 years." And uh, but that's just. Yeah, that's just the way people perceive things, right? So, yeah, um, it, it is. And it's, you know, it's just the importance of cleanliness. I mean, it's always been the case for me from a quality perspective, like in, in the back, and it still gives me pain because this is an old building. There's wood in places, and it's like, you know, there's a little bit of uh, unease at times, So, but you got to make sure processes are good and um, clean stuff and, yeah. What was it like? Because we're gonna taste this later, the kettle sour. Yeah. What was it like doing kettle sour for the first time? <laughs> because with wood in here, that's gotta be just one of the biggest fears you've got of yeast traveling somewhere. Yeah. And you're never gonna get rid of it after that. No, I, I did have the thought, I'm like, well, I can make a kettle sour for just open up the tank and let it inoculate itself here uh, with zero control, right? So, yeah. Um, no, thankfully, uh, like the way I did it, like it's still pretty safe, like keeping it all in the kettle as opposed to transferring it to another vessel. Okay. Like if I did it that way, but I have the, because we're not brewing like, you know, at capacity, I have the capability to leave it in the kettle. I know whereas some people have to transfer it out to another tank. So they'll let the lacto do its thing. I can do it all in the kettle and then heat that up in the kettle. So that kills and the lacto never leaves the kettle then even yeah, I'm pretty yeah. cautious even when recircling through the heat exchanger like i make sure it's all kind of killed off before before i do that process so um yeah i wasn't too worried about that but it was i i found it interesting from a philosophical point of view because um the the sauerkraut lager the raspberry we've kind of rebranded it as raspberry lager but for many years it was the sauerkraut yeah um and if you trace i don't even know how old that brand is but it um it was one of the quote unquote original sours again i'm using a lot of air quotes here yeah because it's not really a true sour right um so there's no but it's of, an original sour yeah right but before they were a thing so yeah. um and it's kind of manufactured a bit. There's stuff added in to, to make it that way. But, you know, and checking the pH, because when I first came here, I'm like, okay, what is this sour? Right? So I checked the pH and I'm like, it's 3.9. That's not sour at all. Like there's some loggers that are 3.9. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, okay. Again, it's a light beer with the addition of the raspberry. That It gives a nice tart and refreshing. Yeah. And it's a great, great beer. But I mean, this kettle sour is actually 3.3. It's a true sour. So... Yeah. Yeah, that's been uh, 
interesting, right? Philosophically to, to have these two sours. Yeah. But here we are. Oh, let's go to the side. All right. Yeah, I should have settled a little bit. The, the K, oh, I'm just going to. The K we've got, we did the kegging at the end. So there's a little extra puree in, in this than, uh, than the cans would have. So it's probably better to do it that way. Yeah. Better to have an unstable keg where I can, this sounds like a proverb, better to have an unstable keg where I can control it than an unstable can where I can't. Yeah. You write the, the beer proverbs? <laughs> yeah, beer proper. Dream. Yeah. So mango and peach. The interesting thing again with that just a position juxtaposition with the raspberry sauerkraut is there's flavor in, it, in that. So it's easy yeah. to get that raspberry flavor. Now I've always maintained that I love the integrity of a true fruit sour where it's just the puree the fruit itself but i i know you're not going to get that punch of of the flavor because you ferment out the fruit it's the yeah. safe way to do it without creating bombs of cans and that sort of thing so so again that's an education point so i'll tell people like in the other people when they sell that don't expect like a super strong peach mango flavor it's subtle it's there um but it's more like kind of in the mouth feel and it really balances out the sour and that's why i love the puree because i it doesn't turn into like this like puckering like overly acidic sort of uh drink so anyway love to hear your thoughts on it no it you it's up yeah right. like the peaches are the, the peach comes through quickly but you have to you know like it's not the first step it's the mm -hmm. second step mm -hmm. The mango takes a little bit longer to develop because it's it's hiding underneath the peach flavor. You know, so the peach flavor that happens right up here, mm -hmm. and then the mango is a lot more inside the mouth. The mouth, if you see right, the mouth feel, but it takes a minute to develop. You know, but I can see like an excellent patio beer. Yeah, hot day, fantastic beer to be drinking. Mm -hmm. You know. Comes down nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. The sour is there, but it's not puckering, like you said. Yeah. So. so it's been a year. It's been it's been just a little over a year since we we did the, the collab and the full release with Eric. Yeah. You know, you've had a, you know you you you've got a solid almost twelve months under your belt here. How's it feel? <laughs> it feels good, but I feel like I've still got a lot to, to do and, and uh, like the comfort level. And I think this is maybe more my, my character and cause I, I have a hard time just like resting easy as in that I've arrived. So as soon as I feel kind of comfortable with something then I'm like always looking to the next thing to um, and we'll get into the barrels a bit. Like part of my, I have all these ideas. I love like standard, regular beers, like just go to beers. Um, and we make those, but I also love barrel beers. I love funky beers. I've got ideas for the caverns, like, you know, having a sour section down there where it's really isolated and maybe even isolating some of the bacteria and yeast that's down there that probably has been down there for 150 years, right? So, you know, like that's the, to answer your question, um, how do I feel? Yeah, like I feel, I feel good. I feel good because my drive home is only 20 minutes now. And uh, which has meant I, I'm working more, but like, I'm okay with that right now. This is the summer, this is the time to do that. And then I know it'll relax more in the fall and, uh, and winter when I can work on projects, but um, yeah, I feel I feel at home. Actually, I think that'd be the way to put it. It was interesting. I had um, Mike Brooks. Oh, have you had him on? No, I've had Mike Brooks. On. Oh, okay. From, you can give me an intro afterwards. Yeah, for uh, Good Lot in Caledon. 
uh, and George Eagleson from the from the college. Yeah. They both stopped by. They were on vacation, and so I worked with both of them at Wellington at different times. Known George since uh, Muskoka years, where I first met him. Yeah. When Muskoka was like downtown, the old place. Yeah. Um, where Catalyst is now. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, but Mike had this. Mike's a really insightful guy, and he had this. Um, this, like, we were talking about the process because he now uh, works at Good Love, but he's basically runs a the show there. He's a one man team. Not really. There's other people, but he brews, and so he's responsible right through, kind of like what I do here, mm -hmm. right? So there's there's other people that help in that, but it's and so he was like, no, this this really suits you. He's like, this is this is where you were meant to be, sort of thing. So that kind of kind of like. Yeah, just that analysis that that him sort of speaking to me we both we went through some dark times together where you know there was there were some rough times at wellington through the expansion years and uh so he's seen me at uh, different times i've seen him but for him, for that like that perspective i felt was um it was both comforting and uh um yeah i was really thankful for it so yeah i said this Six months ago when you were up, you look far more relaxed than you have in a long time. Thank you. But I am going to say this as well. How many people did you take under your wing in Wellington who have gone on to be brewers elsewhere? Uh, there's there's a bunch. Dave, Kevin, like let's you know, you can go through the list. Yeah. You know, there's quite a few people mm -hmm. who have, you know, trained with you, work with you. And you're right, seeing you through the seeing my flaws, yeah. <laughs> who have who have gone out to be fantastic groups. Oh yeah. And other people's places. You know. I'm very so I'm honored to be sitting here with one of the people I consider, I'm not gonna say the grandfather of craft brewing in Ontario, but one of the more, one of the more influential brewers in the development of all the fantastic craft breweries that we have here in Ontario right now. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Now we're gonna get off the modern thing and go on with real. Yeah. What's uh, what is sort of the one thing right now that you are? I'm not gonna use the word struggling, but it's like foremost on your mind that needs to be taken care of as we're moving into this new post sort of COVID normal that we're coming into. Hmm. That is a really good question. Yeah, it's the trick one because I should have talked to you before about it. No, it's it's all right. It's sometimes you like the no, no, I did yeah. right? And you're really just asking what's what's on my mind. I I think. I think it's really getting people together again for conversations. There still feels like there's a lot of division, um, a lot of opinions that aren't being, are not being discussed in like in a respectful sort of forum or place because everything was done online we already knew this but like there's been studies on this we knew the online format is not the best for having like these type of discussions it lends itself a lot to um people hiding behind a different persona it lends itself to a whole bunch of different problems there are some positive things there are some great things about it no but you're hitting the nail on the head the anonymity that people can create for themselves yeah online means that we, we can have very disrespectful conversations and you can you can find your own group of people and just um you know reinforce ideas that may not be good ideas right and so i'm always like i've always been a big proponent of having discussions between people especially when you don't agree on something and trying to see from the other person's point of view like why they're looking at it like that and um and I feel like that needs to happen in more places like this, like in breweries. And I feel like breweries can play a part. I'm a little worried that breweries have gone 
perhaps a little bit to one way in the discussion and I kind of understand why, but I think that we could do a better job of being more, to foster those conversations instead of trying to like, okay, you think that way, you're not welcome here sort of thing. Okay, well let's, if that person's willing, and sometimes people bring it upon themselves and they don't belong in the conversation because they are so big headed and, um, and yeah, they have to be at the right place. So I, I'm, I don't really have the answer. It's just, you asked what was on my mind and, and that's kind of <laughs> yeah. what it is. Like, it's how do we, how do we do that? How do we reconcile? How do we bring sides together that don't want to be together, but do it in a way where they can actually hear each other and see and, and come to some sort of a mutual respect for each other and maybe change, right? And so. Yeah. The, the danger is we we always we think that we're we're right and we haven't figured out. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I know that I had I, the less I haven't figured out. Absolutely fair. I have so, I, I have time and time again, and a lot of the people that watching us here have heard me say this at the bar. You know, I turn to a young kid who's 19 years old in university, and I'll look at him and I'll go look at I said, I'll tell you the one thing I've learned in all the travels that I did. And everything that I've done in my life, the more that I learned, the more that I knew absolutely sweet bugger all. Yeah. That I knew nothing. Because when you start getting out in the real world, you start realizing that, wow, it doesn't matter. Because, like, even if I know this, it's still all that over there that is completely opaque to me. Yeah. So I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, you know, we, we've, uh, the, the craft industry's gone through a massive transition. With, with the whole Me Too movement that's been mm -hmm. going on. And rightly so, there's there's been some issues that were swept under the carpet for years that needed to be brought out. Absolutely. But there's also the other dialogues that have been going on in the craft beer industry about a whole different range of things. Yeah, yeah. And I hear what you're saying. I mean, how do we bring people together over a great beer to have an honest conversation and have the respect to be able to go, okay, I'm, I'm never going to agree with you, but let's just respectfully disagree. Yeah. Because there's always going to be irreconcilable positions that some people take that can't. Yeah. I have very, very religious friends who I still hang out with. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to change that religious view and I'm never going to change my religious view. Yeah. And, and why should I? Yeah. So I hear what you're saying on that. Yeah. So, anyway, tough times right now <laughs> and in some ways, yes. Yeah. So it's interesting. But it, yeah. it's that concept that in the moment and i have to remind myself of this in the moment when i think that i'm so confident in my opinion that i also thought that when i was 30 about something and now when i look back on my 30 year old self i'm like what an idiot right and i saw that when i was 20 my 30 year old person looked back at the 20 year old like, what an idiot but in the moment i was very confident that i was right and i had the right opinion on this matter so, and it's not to say you shouldn't have those opinions, it's more to, to hold a little more loosely to how confident we are in, in certain areas. So my mom, then, you know, bless her soul, she got to a few years ago. My mom had a conversation with me when I was 19 years old, pig-headed and thought I knew all the answers about, so that, that was when the abortion issue had raised its, that was when Morgan Tyler was, pushing the envelope mm -hmm. and the government was dealing with the issue of legalizing abortion. Mm -hmm. And my mom, very, very religious, the woman who washed my mouth out with a bar of live soap, live soap because I swore at my brother mm -hmm. and had to get those dirty words out of my mouth, turns to me and she goes, here, you Just what I do with my body is none of your, and for my mom to swear, goddamn business. Just blew me away. Wow. And it made me step back and go, oh, maybe I'm not right. <laughs> not because I don't want to argue with my mom. It's like, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I need to really think about what this was all about. Mm -hmm. And so that really opened my eyes to, to and, and I hear what you're saying, because I've got the same thing. You go back and talk to my 20 year old self and you talk to me today and those are worlds apart mm -hmm. because I've experienced so much more. Yeah. And to think critically through things, right. And that's just the, uh... The thing, but yeah, yeah, it is. And it says that we're going to call you the uncle of the craft beer industry. Okay, I'll, I'll be the. I kind of like that one. Thanks, Ed. 
we're going to do the barrel age 10w30. All right. So again, this is our the start of our. Well, we had a Scotch barrel um, that we put the Scottish pale ale in, and uh, so that was our first. And then whiskey barrels for the 10w. So um, yeah, I mean it's got the great color. So whiskey is interesting because it's um, it's had some stuff in it already. So like these barrels were, it's not like bourbon where it's only had one thing in it. So it's like, they weren't super fresh when I got it. So the, the notes I find are more subtle towards that, yeah. but I love kind of what it does on the, on the flavor. So anyway, I'm, um, Wow, you're right. It really pulls those whiskey flavors, yeah, forward. And it's interesting because you don't get it up front, um, but then you get it in the middle, and then the finish. I absolutely love because it's almost the same as the finish you would get from having a whiskey without quite the um, the burn, right? So it's got the it's got that when you breathe in, you get the same sensation, but without um, the burn of the alcohol. Because it's only like six and a half percent, so. So I'm trying to remember, I haven't had 10 w 30 for quite some time. Is there a caramel base in 10 w 30 mm -hmm. Okay, so that's coming with that, that. Yeah, Car Aroma is a big malt in it. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Is that that the, the, the whiskey flavors are coming through and then the, the caramel just slides in there so smoothly. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I kept the carbonation pretty low yeah. to try to, again, because barrel aged beers, I find the carbonation get really mess with them. If you go too high, it, like you lose, like it's, it's trying to escape in your mouth. So you lose yeah. that smoothness yeah. that, that any like, you know, barrel aged, who should have should be smooth. Yep. Yep. That's nice. And it's still a sipper, even though it's not like ten percent or anything. It's no, it, it, yeah, it's still a sipper. It's uh, Yeah, you're going to be hard pressed to duplicate that one, aren't you? <laughs> Where are we going to find that kind of a barrel? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you got that right. So, another stumper question for you. That is, in your opinion, we had two plus years of COVID. Um, how has that? Changed craft beer industry. I think they really, um, or we really learned to pivot rapidly. Um, and in many ways, we were already kind of set up for that. Being craft brewers, often we only work like a week ahead of time and i mean there are larger ones that have their plan for the year sort of thing but a lot of craft brewers are working on very tight just in time sort of schedule and that actually that meant they were prepared for it where other people other industries maybe weren't as well um but changing yeah like there was this Call it like a, a vacuum or a, um, a an emptiness from the fact that many of us were in this for community, and when you know we couldn't go out to the bar to support a licensee that had our beer and to meet some people like that, we couldn't have people into our tasting room. Um, <clears throat> there, I think a lot of people became very. You know, lonely, there was a lot of movement and some of that didn't manifest itself until like 
you know, year and a half, two years in. But what I've been noticing even lately is there's been, seems to be a lot. And I know that's not actually unique to the, the brewing industry. It's just that's happening a lot in the world right now. People are just changing jobs. Like it's much more rapidly than any other sort of time. And I don't know, that, that would be a big thing to dive into, I think. Um, but yeah, it's interesting for beer. Cause I, I found personally, I really missed out cause I used to, I would travel to breweries fairly often. I would, it was those kind of social, um, atmospheres the conferences and things like that where that just didn't happen and I really missed that like I found you know just you know you, you feel pretty isolated um I was thankful to be at Wellington because we had a larger team so you still got that sense of community there um but you know coming up here you know you're working pretty pretty alone so it's been good that we were coming out of it and uh I don't know I think there's we're going to be come to a crossroads, probably a little bit of a, a reckoning. I, there's a sense of, of because a lot of the breweries sort of exploded over the past five years. I'm not sure how long everyone can keep it up because breweries are not necessarily all fun. So when you when you have the idea of a brewery, the thought of a brewery, I'm shocked. I know. <laughs> And it is fun for a while, but to keep that up for, you know, when you get past the five year mark, I feel, I don't know, I'm speculating here, but I, I don't know what's going to happen over the next, but I feel like COVID really, COVID kept people going. It was in some ways you just, because you had to, um, but now that there are options, there are other things happening. I'm not sure if as many people will stay in it as, yeah. you know, but I don't know. I could be wrong. Well, we've, we've, we've got a combination of days of reckoning in this industry. Yeah. We've got price fluctuations that are happening because of supply issues, because of inflation. Yeah. Um, no one knows what the full impact of the, the Russian Ukraine war is going to be on the mall. Yeah. But yeah. we haven't figured that out yet. No. Or the fact that there's been crop failures elsewhere in the world because of drought. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, you're right. It's going to be interesting. And how like we have to price our beers higher just to, because we have high overhead for the size and it's to try to make some money. So when groceries are going up as much as they are, are people going to still choose to pay four or $5 for a can of beer when you can get another one for two bucks? I, you well, yeah, I mean, we, like I said, the supply chain issues, the inflation, everything yeah. going through that. Um, yeah, people, money's tighter. It's nice that the price of fuel is coming down. Yeah. That's what, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, we, that's been a big chunk of inflationary fuel there right there. We just yeah. get fired up inflation like crazy. You, you know, when it went from $2,700 to $8,000 to bring a truck from California, you know, that's a substantial increase in cost on yeah. 40,000 pounds. Oh yeah, when I was commuting there during the height of it, oh, <laughs> one month it was seventeen hundred dollars in gas. It's like it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's so a lot of money. that's a lot of groceries. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure this was the right thing to do? I have asked that question. <laughs> uh. How are you guys doing on supply chain? We have been fine. Um, I haven't really noticed. I, I know at the end of last year, there was a few times where malt was a bit of an issue um, where we had to make some substitutions and whatnot. But I, I, actually the last six months, probably, I haven't had any issues. Um, again, I guess you, you touched wood on that because, uh, yeah, I haven't actually had trouble getting anything. So. There's been weird things with suppliers where we've had a bunch of things show up that have been like not done well, and we've had to send back a printing wise. That's very common. Right now. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I'm not sure what's going on with that because we've had multiple issues like that, and it feels like 
and you know with qc stamps on it and everything and it's like okay what's uh i don't know if people are short staffed and it's like i don't know short staff the training new staff yeah there's there's you know the issues of a lot of places where like their legacy people are gone yeah you know now you kind of get all new people and now you're dealing with all of those issues well yeah. i was just talking to a couple that came in uh today from australia their son lives in the village actually so they're over at first time in like four years uh, they were saying the same thing they're retired but over there they're having trouble normally they would have people that go to Australia just so they can hang out so they'll get jobs and they want to see, they want to surf, they want to do that, but they'll work all those part-time jobs that are there and people are just not coming. So they're asking all these people to come out of retirement basically to work again. Yeah. And it's interesting, but a lot of people that have retired are like, no, I, I want my retirement. I'm working eight hours a week of reverence yeah. in the tap room. Enjoy that. Yep. Yeah. It's okay. You'd be busier. It'd be nicer. I had one night when I was run off my feet, which is great. Yeah. Well, so, you can predict that, right? It'd be, you can't predict that. No, you've worked that. long enough that <laughs> we have the same thing here. It's like two of us, and it's like, oh, it's a Wednesday. We're not going to be busy. And then we're like running back and forth, and there's people everywhere. And yeah. Yeah. And you can't predict that because you never know when that's going to happen. No. And, you know, I'm at a pains for years to explain to people, yeah, I know you're upset because the patio up there, you had to wait, but you understand that they didn't staff for a full patio. No. Because that's never happened. <laughs> Except today. Yeah. <laughs> well, they should. And it's like, no, you can't afford no. to put four people on that patio when it's not. It's, no. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. Like I, like we were talking earlier, I, you know, we're, we're navigating through what our post-COVID new normal looks like. And no one knows what that looks like right now. Huh. No one two years ago were going to predict that we were going to have our interest rates go up 2% overnight. Yeah. That inflation was going to top 8%. Like, no one thought that. No. You know? Because we couldn't really see a way out, right? That was the whole... Like, we knew it wasn't going to go forever, but nobody could, nobody could look beyond it and, and see what that would look like. And we're still struggling to kind of define it now, right? So... So if you look at the numbers, we're not out of it. No, 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 no. It, you know, no, and, and, but, that, but that's a hard conversation because we're also not seeing the number of people dying as we did because we've now at least got 80 plus percent of our population with, that have been vaccinated. And the versions are not maybe as severe as yeah. what we were getting at the beginning. Yeah. But I mean, I, I've got two or three friends who are struggling through long COVID. Yeah. yeah. And one of them, it's been two years. Yeah. And the other one, it took them nine months to diagnose negative COVID tests until the day he felt really, really good. And then he had a positive COVID test. And then for 27 days in a row, positive COVID test. Like, you know, and, and it's like, see, I told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we don't know. That's, That's right. a mystery. Yeah. Hmm? It's a mystery. Yeah, yeah it is. There's no, there's no easy answer. Thank you. You're welcome for taking time out of your busy schedule and hosting me here tonight. This is fantastic. For you guys, I'm getting the full tour after this, including going to the caverns. And we can't take you there because uh, the Wi Fi doesn't reach that far, no. or we would be down in the cavern doing our yeah. broadcast from there. <laughs> Something about dirt in between, you know. It's a lot of layers, it's 20 feet under there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and next week, uh, Cam Pryor is going to join me from uh, Royal City. I'm looking forward to that. And three weeks from now, uh, we're on the 6th of September, uh, Chris and Bebo finally had a Tuesday where they're not swamped and they're going to join us from Third Moon. Wow. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I've been, that's been three months to make. <laughs> I sent him a message. It's like, hey, man, we'd love to, but we're so busy. Yeah, you know, and I get it. The, the world's reopened. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know what how many people we need in the shop. We're trying to do all these beer festivals, and oh, we're doing collabs again. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. huge. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording in the yeah. as soon as I figure out where everything is now. <laughs>